I'm delighted that you could join us for our webinar today titled Implant Me Implants, Making Cross-Media Work, sponsored by Canon Solutions America. Um, and we've got a great program put together for you today, and I'm joined by what I consider to be one of the most progressive implants um, in the industry, and it's the World Bank. And so I've got with me today uh, Dave Leonard, who's the manager of printing and multimedia services, and Jimmy Dainstein, who's the printing facility manager. Um, before we get started today, what I would like to do is just give you a few tips for enjoying the webinar. First of all, if you are having any technical difficulties, let us know by using the Q&A box or you can troubleshoot by clicking on the help widget. Uh, if you've got a question for any of our speakers today, um, what you can do is submit it via the Q&A tab. And as the questions come in, we'll try and answer as many as we possibly can. Make sure that you disable pop-up blockers. And if you want to see what the console can do, you can clip click on the Tips for Attendees widget um, for a complete rundown. Now, let me take you through what we're going to be discussing today. Um, the first thing is I'm going to spend some time talking to you and sharing with you some survey work that InfoTrends did relative to how implants are moving up the value chain and what they're planning on investing, especially as it links with cross-media solutions. Then the World Bank, and that's Jimmy and Dave, are going to share with you how they're implementing some leading-edge edge solutions for their constituency. We'll wrap up with a few recommendations and conclusions, and we'll touch on any questions that we might not have gotten to. Let me start by, I think, one of the most important things for implant managers, and that's what's important to your end user base. We went out and we actually surveyed almost 900 corporate uh, enterprises, and they were an array of different departments. And we asked them, what criteria do you use for choosing how you get print done? And the answer was, first of all, a broad range of services and capabilities, making sure that it was price competitive, and speed. By the way, those are three key areas, especially competitive pricing, and turnaround time, where implants should be at a significant advantage in terms of serving those buyers. We also asked that same set of, of end users how important it was for a print services vendor to offer the following services, things like mailing and fulfillment, graphic design, email messaging, strategic marketing services, materials warehousing were at the top of the list, but when you looked toward the future, they're really looking for a partner that will help them with getting into the mobile world and cross-media campaigns, as well as doing a better job with websites. One of the big messages that we heard from the enterprises, and 45% of the respondents said that whoever they selected as that print service provider, they really wanted them to be offering multi-channel campaign support. And so what we're seeing is a market that's in transition. And when I talk to implants, what I tell them is it's an evolution and not a revolution. And that path and the success that we've seen in terms of implant operations is pretty well defined. Basically what happens is that implant, and the implant has always been a leader in the investment in digital print technology, starts with investing in digital print technology. That, by the way, is both sheet-fed and what we're also seeing a lot of is large format investments. Once they've got that portion of their business stabilized and they're doing a great job at digital large formats and short-run print, the next thing that they do is they add on a service for their user community in terms of web-enabling the implant print shop. And what that really does for that implant is it creates a stickiness factor with that user community. Typically, the next sec step is they build out some variable data. Then they'll move into helping end users with email and personalized URL campaigns. Sometimes they'll do some basic data and campaign management. Then they start adding things like mobile and social until all of a sudden, they're really a provider of integrated marketing services. Now, there's a reason that this evolution is so important. When you start with web to print, when we talked to the enterprises, they told us that basically they were procuring almost 32% of their print 
via the web. Their projection is that in the next 24 months, that's going to climb to 40%. And what we're seeing are a lot of your peers in the industry offer significant services. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to pre present at the Implant Graphics Association meeting, and um, Debbie Pavletich from Briggs & Stratton shared some of the things that they were doing. And basically, what she's doing with web enablement is helping their dealer channel and letting them uh, do promotional materials via the website. And what she's got is, is it's a tool, and it's called Briggs & Stratton Promotions, and it's an online service that makes ordering Briggs & Stratton promotional postcards, product literature, and advertising easy for that dealer community. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield and Catherine Sierrity out of upstate New York did a lot of work relative to simple things, stationary items. And what they did is they created a work plan to bring the production of business cards in-house. They worked with brand communications and sister companies to standardize and reduce the number of business card templates. They developed a simple online order entry form. They used Fusion Pro Dynamics to do that. They actually even placed QR codes on the back of the cards. The bottom line was they saved purchasing headcount and they met delivery expectations of less than three days. At the time, or in the first four months that they um, had the system up and running, they would pr printed and delivered more than 61,000 business cards. Um, they also did some work in terms of a personalized, care, uh, personalized process for member care management booklets. They redesigned the educational materials um, into an 8.5 by 11 booklet. What happened is they created an online order entry form where the marketing communications team could include customer information. Again, they used Fusion Pro to create a personalized letter using the information put in by the communications team. The address is included on the back of the booklet. And then the MCM members could request booklets for single or multiple customers and have the order routed to document services for printing and mailing. So all things that were done via the web in terms of offering a broader base of services, but also in ensuring that you're instilling a lot of loyalty with that end user base. Now, the next thing that we see as people move up the value chain is the need for personalized and segmented marketing. And when we surveyed the enterprise, and it was more than 1,000 companies, what they basically said was that when they're doing a marketing campaign, more than 60% of them today are either one-to-one -one or they're segmented. And that's a big number when you take a look at what's going on in the marketplace. Now, the other piece that they told us was that, oh, by the way, those campaigns are increasing in complexity. And what they're seeing is a larger number of more highly complex campaigns that include variable pictures and images, variable blocks of text, um, and dynamic composition. And the volume of higher complexity variable data campaigns is increasing. Now, I'd like to give you an example of the kinds of things that we're seeing in the marketplace. And by the way, for this example, my belief is that anyone that's on this webinar could generate this campaign. And I tell folks, think about it. A lot of you have sons or daughters that are graduating from high school. This is an example of a young girl who's a high school senior. And in fact, she has a lot of choices um, in terms of going to college. When you take a look at the average prospective college student, this is the type of mail they get. And in fact, the average prospective college student gets over 10 pounds of print from over 50 schools. Now think about that for just a minute. There are about 13.7 million students in public or private four-year universities. There are about 3.5 million that are freshmen. That equates to 30 to 35 million pounds of printing. That's a lot of printing. But what you've got to think about is that these students have 400 plus friends on Facebook. They're sending 100 to 150 texts a day. And so that mail piece needs to be very, very powerful. And so what happened is when you look at these two pieces, good schools, Fordham, um, Washington University, but they never got, they never got opened. 
Rather, these kinds of things caught her attention. This one from Sacred Heart says, hey, Margaret, are you ready to build the future you want? This one was actually done at Rochester Institute of Technology. And basically what they did is they put her name on the postcard, um, told her exactly how far from home she'd be. And when you think about it, pretty powerful. And then on the flip side, there was a personalized URL to a landing page where all of her information had been pre-populated to make that application for admission very, very simple to do. Now, the message inside of this is she did look at the Rochester snowfall. Um, now, when you think about what people are doing today, what we're seeing is that people are connecting print to digital channels. And when we asked the corporate executives what they were doing, they basically said that things like brochures, direct mail, bills and statements are being linked to digital channels, whether it's a web landing page, whether it's a mobile website. And the logic and the types of things that they're linking to are, as I said, websites, social media sites, mobile apps, or image files. The logic behind that and what we're seeing in the marketplace and what I tell service providers of all types is that you really need to figure out how to leverage mobile. Mobile is that bridge that's going to link the digital and physical worlds. The reason I think it's important, and I'll give you a couple of gee whiz statistics, believe it or not, there are more mobile devices in the world than there are people today. And you might say, Barb, I don't believe that. Think about it. how many mobile devices are in your home. I know you all have a cell phone. You've got a tablet of some form. So when you think about it, it's a big market opportunity. But the other piece you've got to look at is how people are using media. I happen to have three grandchildren that are teenagers. If I send them something in the mail, it does get opened instantaneously because it's right before their birthday or Christmas, and they know the envelope has got money in it. If I send them an email, I'll never hear back. And the reason I won't is they refuse to be sitting at a desk chained to their PCs like we are today. Um, and yet, if I send them a text, I will hear back in less than 30 seconds. And so you've got to figure out, and the winners in the market are going to figure out how to make a static piece of paper work effectively with a mobile device. And the benefits of doing that are, first of all, it adds and makes paper interactive. Secondly, it extends the value of that media. And last but not least, it's very, very measurable. And so we're really seeing what I categorize as three or four critical executions relative to making print interactive with mobile. The first thing is we're seeing mobile barcodes, QR codes, which all of you are familiar with. And basically what we've learned is that, well, awareness and what they were um, has been pretty constant for the last couple of years. We did a survey in 2011. We redid it in 2013. The use of mobile barcodes by consumers has almost doubled. And it's climbed from 20% to over 43%. Um, when you look at mobile messaging, we're seeing a lot of companies using paper and saying, if you text this number, I'll send you a coupon on your cell phone. My favorite example, my granddaughter loves to shop. And so we were walking through the mall. We're in front of the Gap store, and the Gap has a sign, printed sign, in front of it that says, if you text this number, you can become part of our VIP club and we'll give you 20% off of everything that you buy in the Gap store today. Pretty powerful. Another thing that's taking off is something we hear called near-field communications. It's a little less familiar to a lot of you, but basically what it is is it's a tag, and it's basically got an electronic component in it. Now, if you've got a droid phone, your droid is, is NFC enabled. It's got an NFC tag reader in it. And I'll wave that tag within four or five uh, inches of, of a piece of paper. It will pick up the signal and automatically route to whatever that NFC tag is programmed to do. Now, the benefit of this is that I don't need to download an app 
today if I've got a Droid phone. It has not yet been enabled for the iPhone. Our view is that Apple's going to have to make a decision relatively soon. They've got something called iBeam that's proprietary, or they'll have NFC tags. I can download an app, by the way, to my iPhone to do NFC tag reading. And um, what we're seeing used in a lot of different places. The example that's on this slide um, is somebody that's waving a cell phone over an NFC tag, and it could link to recipes while you're in a grocery store. Um, I have a client that's using it for signage, and what they're doing is they're putting it in signage in transit shelters. And so when I wave my cell phone against this restaurant sign in a transit shelter, it will link to a menu. I can select the items, and let's assume it's morning, that I want to pick up for dinner, and then it will actually let me enter my credit card number for billing. The last area that we're starting to see a lot of action around is augmented reality. And it's a relatively new technology that adds a digital layer of information on top of objects. And what I categorize as it does is it places them in the real world. It makes them pop to life. And I can point my smartphone or my webcam at an AR-enabled object, and it will be able to engage or interact with a number of different types of experiences. We're seeing them used for a number of different applications. By the way, some of them very, very practical in terms of customer service. Now, in concert with North American Publishing Company and Implant Graphics and Printing Impressions, we actually did a study titled The Next Big Thing and looked at where investments were being made in the marketplace. And we talked to 86 implant respondents as a part of the survey. The titles were a variety of different titles. Uh, this shows the mix ranging from managers or directors or supervisors. Um, what they told us was that this is how they ran their business. 43% um, were full cost recovery. 34.9% were partial cost recovery. Some were cost centers. And there were others, 4.7%, that were profit centers. When you looked at the number of implants that were a, the number of employees in the implant, I think you'd say this is pretty typical. The majority that we surveyed had fewer than 10 people. We also asked them basically how much they expected the print production's revenue to change in the next uh, year in 2014. This gives you a pretty good feel for the mix in terms of increases and decreases. And what you see is the majority of the people we surveyed were either going to be flat or increasing in terms of overall revenue. We asked them about what they were planning on buying. And what you're seeing is, and as we look at the realm of, of cross-media and making that market migration, some of them were focused on workflow software. The second thing of, or of equal importance was variable data publishing, you know, followed by some creative layout software, web to print. And you can see that there's an interest in terms of moving into more channels. Now, the other question that we asked is which of the following software investments do you look at in terms of overall business growth? And the number one investment was multi-channel communications, variable data, followed by automating marketing. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we're seeing people take a look at. We also asked that same audience, which of the following software investments do you intend to make to power new offerings? And they said, hey, I'm going to buy some tools for marketing operations, customer relationship management, and doing a better job at managing data. Um, the other major component we saw was a lot of these new services that they're looking at offering, they're planning on doing in-house. So you take a look at the marketplace today, there's opportunity in terms of how they plan on offering those capabilities. Now, with that as a backdrop, what I want to do is turn it over to my friends at the World Bank, Dave and Jimmy, and what they're going to do is, is really take some time to share with you what they're doing, and of equal importance, how they're doing it, and the impact and the value that it has at the World Bank. So with that, I am going to turn over to Dave and Jimmy. Take it away, guys. All right. Well, thanks, Barb. Uh, uh, this is Dave Leonard. I'm happy to be uh, on this webinar today with everyone. Uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about our, our operation at the World Bank, and I'm going to start that with uh, telling you, explaining what the World Bank is. It's not actually a bank. 
It's an international organization uh, designed by charter, sort of like the UN, but with its mission to uh, uh, to alleviate poverty and have shared prosperity. It came out of uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement in post-World War II for reconstruction of uh, Europe uh, as uh, uh, part of which is the World Bank Group has a couple different groups, but the International Bank for Reconstruction Development was what was founded right in '44. It's it is uh, have member countries. So the way the bank works is actually there's uh, lending countries and borrowing countries, and the lending countries uh, pay into the World Bank, and the World Bank then invests that money on, on uh, in, in the world markets and tries to make money with the money, and then it funds lending and development and outright grants operations to that. So. So that, as the slide you're seeing right now, the financial services for, for poor countries or what we refer to as highly impoverished countries or conflict states, we, we do outright grants and very low interest loans, but we also provide a whole lot of technical assistance in development areas on specific things like health and education, agricultural, sustainable development, uh, infrastructure and transportation environment. And then we also, uh, these are very complex lending instruments, so we, we have a whole uh, another uh, group that deals just with insurance uh, for uh, guarantee assurance for these investments uh, to the shareholders of the bank. But uh, the sum of all that is that the World Bank is actually a knowledge institution. We generate a whole lot of knowledge, and we have to share that knowledge too. So uh, I like to tell my team in the, the printing and multimedia services that if we do our job well and, and help our clients communicate, then, then they can go out and, and do their jobs and help the, the 40 to 50 percent of the world that lives on less than two dollars a day. So you know it's a good mission, and we're really proud of that uh, in that knowledge and sharing. So to do that, uh, we employ a lot of different things. I, I'm manager of the printing and multimedia services group, and I came into this role about two and a half years ago. I have a film and video background, uh, but I did have a, a still photography too, and, and I grew up in a papermaking family, so it, it was a good natural blend of, of all that to bring it into the printing world too. So, But when I came in, I really wanted to deliver on multi-channel communications. And uh, so... Uh, I, I started with this integrated media delivery, and they, here the slide you're seeing right now is uh, the products that we actually do. We do a lot of printing. It's all uh, books and, and publications, non-transactional. Uh, we do graphic design production, and we have a big cartography unit too, which is kind of unique to us. Uh, uh, we have a lot of interest in in mapping, and that's one of the areas too. We're, we're going to get into animated maps or, or active maps to, to add a temporal element to it to see how things change over time, like life expectancy and availability of water. Uh, we do photography, digital asset management, and have standard photocopy, large wide format poster printing, and then the new areas, uh, e-products and uh, and uh, designing a mail invites and uh, and then audiovisual services, which was what I brought from my previous position at the bank. We are a full chargeback, full cost recovery unit. So as close as any unit in the bank, I operate like a small business inside the bank. So this multi-channel world has really uh, changed it. We 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 start with a client, and the client has a message to communicate, and. Uh, uh, so obviously, as you all know out there and familiar with uh, traditional printing, you can communicate that message via printing, and we do a lot of that. Uh, but we can also do it through audiovisual, through through the very mature technologies of of video production and uh, and some of the more newer ones of uh, power, you know, the design PowerPoint or or even now the Prezi things, uh, Prezi presentation softwares. Anything like that, but uh, it also encompasses some other ones like uh, uh, new media. So the e-books, where it really you start to integrate both of them together. We have an e-publication, and you can insert uh, video into these e-publications. So uh, these are things that I challenge my my team with, and that we're beginning to deliver on. Uh, and it's been an interesting uh, uh, research and experiment for us. So. These, uh, uh, 
I have to credit my colleague Jimmy here uh, with designing this wonderful PowerPoint, and, and, and Jimmy has a background in animation too, so he added these little vehicles here that you're seeing, the, the, the little spaceship, because each one of these things, think of it as a vehicle for communication. And uh, uh, so... Dave, Dave, I have a quick question for you. Sure, go ahead. You've got the concept of audiovisual. How, how much in demand is that at, at the bank? And take everybody through again how you're structured to help with some of the AV side of it. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll get into that a little later, too. But briefly, okay. bri briefly in the AV area, we have, we have three product lines. We have event support. And, and we, we provide support to somewhere about 8,000 events per year, anything from very simple helping clients get PowerPoint presentations to very, very complicated multi-day events with multiple camera shoots and live streaming and things like that. We have a digital signage uh, throughout the bank where we put up e-posters. Uh, we do room integration uh, where we actually build, design, and build uh, out uh, AV systems and rooms. And then we also have... Uh, uh, video production of, of scripted programs or uh, a variety of video tools. So th that's really the, the audiovisual product lines. Okay. And, and let me ask you a question, or and really more of a perspective. Um, so not everybody is going to have, obviously, in the implant world, the uh, resources that the World Bank does. Um, just more curiosity than anything, if I'm a small in pl smaller implant and want to offer some of these capabilities. Do you have any thoughts or recommendations on, on mechanisms for uh, getting to where they would like to be or offering the services from a partnership perspective? Well, I, yes, I do. And, and I, I'm going to say it's actually, you know, nothing's easy, but, it, but doing video now and doing audiovisual production is, has never been easier uh, in the sense that you can get a uh, a DSLR still camera, like a, a good Canon or Nikon, for a reasonable rate that shoots incredible video, and and you, using the like the standard tools, the Adobe Creative Suites and 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 Apple's tools and like that, uh, you basically uh, can integrate all this together in in some in some pretty uh, easy ways. I said I don't I believe the tools have never never been easier. So I encourage. Uh, uh, others out there in other implants to partner with maybe other groups that are doing it within then or to look for for alliances. Okay. Terrific. Thanks. All right. Hi, this is Jimmy Weinstein. Um, so to continue a little bit on what Dave was saying, we had, I'll go back here, we have the message basically, and, and traditionally we've been a printing implant, like, you know, the majority of our IPMA uh, family members, right? And our focus has always been on the equipment and and the and the iron, I guess, and the and how do we get uh, more capabilities and, and and experiment with substrates and ink and etc. Uh, and we feel that the focus, instead of being even directly on the printing itself or even the audiovisual and the new media itself for for the product itself, we really wanted to focus more on the vehicle. How do we how do we basically get our clients to the printing, or how we get our clients to the audiovisual piece, or to the ebook, or website, or etc. Because that's that's really the focus now. And from the from a printing perspective, for example, starting to talk about uh, each of these uh, categories individually, uh, we can actually start talking about exclusively about the vehicle. How do we distribute printing? How do we provide a solid e-commerce infrastructure that could actually get the clients to the books we print, or the brochures we print, or the business cards that we print. And, and we started to look at that even more than what we look at the actual printing process itself. Uh, because if you have an isolated printing facility, it can be the best printing facility in the world, but if you can't get your clients to access the printed product, then you do have a problem. And traditionally, we actually had that problem for many, many years. We had a, a very... A, 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 a non very sexy website, I guess you can say, and, and, it's in, and it was very difficult for our clients to actually get what they wanted. We ended up getting all kinds of requests via email, by phone. Uh, our business cards, even three, six months ago, 
we we were getting scanned copies of business cards with handwritten notes about changes on business cards, et cetera. So, but at the same time, we also invested in our printing facility and our printing capacity. We have a very nice bindery facility, and we always try to be on the cutting edge of the printing itself. We recently installed a, a very nice high high feeding jet. Uh, press uh, in, in, in the middle of our shop that allow us to get into a higher volume uh, with lesser cost and it's very progressive in terms of the kind of product we can output and the cost that we can get. But at the same time, the question was, how do we get to that printed piece uh, without just being a printing facility? So we recently launched uh, our a new storefront via PTI, Markham Central's interface, uh, with a great design which was all done by our internal design team, which did a fantastic job. And uh, Les Barker, for example, in this case, it led the, the whole e-commerce uh, rollout of the of the e-commerce website, and that what really worked out. So basically, in terms of printing, and, and if I have to uh, give an advice here, it's basically stop thinking about the the presses itself and start thinking about the vehicle. How do we get our clients and that message delivered? So, so you can distribute it all, all over the world, over areas where it's hard. Hey, Jimmy, I have a quick question for you on the, the storefront. You said you used uh, uh, PTI. How long was the implementation process for getting the web-enabled storefront up and running? Um, this is Dave. Uh, I, I'm going to say about a year, but we were doing a lot of other stuff at the same time. We had a lot of other yeah. activities going, of like getting the new inkjet press in and and you know we've had a lot of activity in the last two years, but but uh, the storefront has really changed things in the way we re, uh, uh, clients can access our services. And uh, we've I think in an overarching thing, I, I'm looking at a lot of efforts in the marketing and client communication and business development to so we can move past being uh, being order takers into being solution providers and and yeah. and and communication partners with the clients. And, and with that line, I think with, it's a non, it, it, it's a non, I mean, it's a, it's a process that will never stop, I think. You will always be yeah. developing new things for your e-commerce, especially along the lines of creating new products online where you can upload a file and get a brochure that will, and with a three-panel brochure that which you can upload each image or do any variable data information on the website itself. So yeah. just one other great. Just one other quick question, guys. So one of the things that um, our, our, one of the folks asked was, okay, so it, you, know, you worked on, you had a bunch of projects and it took about a year to get up and running. But one of the things is how do you get the end users to use it? What kind of training mechanism did you put in, in place? Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, we've made it very easy for them to use, and then we had a pretty aggressive rollout uh, uh, using our own multi-channel delivery. We, we marketed it, uh, and uh, we we used uh, we developed printing pieces. Uh, and I have a, a a person on my staff who's dedicated now for business development, and we developed a whole campaign around this. Uh, and utilize, and we created print pieces. We utilize digital signage. Uh, we used uh, the World Bank intranet, and uh, and we had uh, we actually got out there in front of people uh, in front of, at the cafeteria entrances, and had uh, had kiosks set up where, and we showed them how to use it. That's great. And let me ask one other quick question. Uh, you know, you it said it took about a year to get it up and running. How much of that was for testing versus? you know, any kind of special implementation capability? Mm. How did you get it tested to get it up and running? Uh, I don't know. Uh, probably about three months. We soft launched it back in the fall. We really launched it uh, right around the first of this year. So it's just a couple months into its official launch, but we've been, we've been soft launching it since last fall and uh, primarily for business card usage, too. Uh, uh. So the World Bank's going through a rebranding exercise, and so one of our major clients uh, is in control of that, and we were trying to do things in coordination with that, which uh, gave us some, uh, some, some sliding on our schedule, really, which we wanted to do. We could have done, okay. had it out sooner, I think. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, on the audiovisual, I did cover a little bit uh, of this already, but so I'll go through it pretty quickly. But the vehicle for audiovisual, you know, the main thing for clients' content is live streaming, which has been a big growth area for us. A lot of video streaming, and then 
uh, video on demand distribution where we, we post uh, videos up uh, for, for, uh, for web viewing later. Uh, digital signage is, is big, that is in concert. We encourage people to print posters in our wide format, but also to do e-posters, and we try to sell that as a package, uh, and then some of our new media products uh, uh, coordinated. So uh, typical audiovisual service, you're seeing that we, we, we do hang out with rock stars sometime, uh, at least uh, the rock stars seem to come to us. There's, there's Bono from U2 because they're usually uh, looking for money for their for their efforts uh, uh, for development or poverty reduction. But but you see a couple examples of some uh, some of the uh, AV events that we really support there, uh, and a lot of these things are live streamed out to the world in in multiple languages. So uh, the primary service that I said are, are technical support to events, uh, and then uh, we have a, a big system integration group, and then uh, the media production delivery, which includes traditional video production, but uh, also some interactive products uh, uh, in coordination on this for the multi-channel delivery. So. Uh, the, there's, that's the, the media center, the live and video on demand, video production, including the whole pre-production, the scripting, and, uh, and then the digital signage uh, design display. We have about 60, 60 uh, uh, signs around the public spaces, and we also create uh, private channels on digital signage. So here's a, this slide shows a current, uh, our current digital signage. Uh, uh, the, the two outer ones are examples of e-posters. Uh, that will run, and then the center one is what we call our composite screen, which uh, is usually running uh, the schedule events on the bottom there in all the various meeting rooms, and then a live news uh, TV feed like CNN or MSNBC up in the right hand, and then a, a smaller version of, uh, of e-posters and news headlines on the left side. So here's a, here's a private channel we do for digital signage. Uh, for our fitness center where they actually uh, uh, pay us under a service level agreement to, ha to have these signs outside the fitness center which lists the schedule, the schedule of uh, the, the fitness classes and who the instructors are and then also health and fitness uh, uh, news items and little posters there. Yeah, I, I want to say that I was taking photos of this a while ago and when in the day I was taking photos there was a big emergency drill at the bank and when I came back and up through that hallway to exit the building this screen turns to this basically so so this is the main reason for being it's usually one of the justifiers you can get for uh, digital signage systems is that emergency messaging uh, and and I actually you know it's not that far from from printing world in in like and, and, and digital prepress right now, and the software is getting easier and easier uh, to do something like this in a, in a networked environment. And, uh, and I, I encourage uh, people to, to look into these solutions because uh, I think you're beginning to see digital signage out in the commercial world uh, more and more. Yeah, and we also implement digital signage on our, on our printing facility. There are our dream is to actually get the screens to show uh, information from our, from our MIS, live data from our system, which can show on different stages of our print shop where the jobs are and the status of different things or messages from your customer service to the pressman, for example. And it can really work like a McDonald's in a way where people can see the orders coming in and they can process them just by seeing a screen. And you have to ask yourself, you know, will I ever need a ticket in the future? And maybe you can maybe live by just looking at a screen and going to the next job. Uh, we also do, uh, besides managing the video conferencing services for the whole bank, we also try to replicate that at the shop. Since we have a facility that is no longer in, the, in our downtown buildings, we try to do Skype a lot between the pressman and the customer service or our binary staff or pre-press, and they try to show samples remotely, and that has, has worked very well. And moving along, on, I guess on our third leg on our on our unit is really on new media focuses, which is this is completely new to everybody, and we all ask ourselves, you know, how do we fit into all this? Uh, will new media kill our printing? 
and we, we're trying to answer those questions right now, and to that, our focus is really on R&D and learning a lot about the market offerings and how do we engage the vendor so we can bring in some of this to our institution. And at the same, like I said, instead of focusing on creating the product, we're focusing on the vehicle. So how do we distribute these new media products like eBooks? Uh, how do we get the client from, to read that eBook? And normally the question, I guess the answer to that coming from the printing world is, well, you do it with printing. Uh, and like Barb said, QR codes are probably the, now recognized all over so people see a, bar, a QR code and know what they can do with it so they can scan it. Uh, frankly, you know, this, from the design, from a design perspective, people hate the, the QRs because there are ugly things in the back of covers. So that's why augmented reality is kind of growing uh, as well. So there's a multiple, multiple vehicles that can can help this little client here reach the his medium and his message. You know, we can do it with printing, we can do it with video streaming, we can do it with an ebook, we can do it with augmented reality, a QR code, a web to print interface. You know, they they can all work independent from one to the other, but we are in the thinking that, you know, they work much better when they are together. When we when you can have pieces that can integrate both video, printing, augmented reality, e media, ebooks, e products, etc. So We've been experimenting a lot uh, with those kinds of products, and here's a little example that we've been doing. Uh, this is our brochure of our printing and multimedia products. Uh, it basically talks about what we just mentioned on printing and photo and video, et cetera. So it's a nice, it's a nice printed piece that you know, what we really like. If you get that little piece and you scan it with an augmented reality app, so this is the same piece in my desk, and you scan it with the app, and you get this little squiggly thing that you know is basically showing you that there's an augmented reality piece inside. You know, if you get your iPhone or your Android phone or your tablet, either way, so it will it will pick up. Normally, you try to put a message in the printed piece saying that there is something to be discovered in there. Uh, so we try to market uh, our products with it. So you scan it, and then what happens? It brings up the same brochure in my desk. And you can see the thing in the middle there is a video. It's a promo video that we shot with our video department uh, in-house. And this is a, a little promo video showing our presses and showing our designers and our photo services, et cetera. And there's a little hand that is hovering in the bottom there that if you click on the little hand, something cool happens. And you can actually have the ebook version of the same brochure. So again, you can have the printed piece. And in the printed, the printed piece can give you an actual video showing on top of the printed piece uh, that is like if, like if it was sitting there. And if, uh, and if you click on it, you can actually have the e-version of it. And you can go just leave the printed piece on your desk and travel, and you can actually have your, your e-book version of it. So, hey, yeah. Hey, Jimmy, I have a question for you. Given the number of publications that you produce at the World Bank, What's the rate of adoption in your mind of the ebook side of it? Well, that's a that's a very difficult question to answer. I think the, we're basically trying to trying to attest the, the, the market and see what, yeah. the, what where this is going. Because when when and I'm going to talk a little bit about our ebook production in a minute. But basically, the, uh, we have the interface to provide an ebook that can accompany every printed piece. And when we started, we said, well, every time we print a book, we're going to do the ebook version, the simple ebook version in which it will look like an actual book that you can, you can flip, like a flip book kind of version, and, and, our, and we can charge something for it, et cetera. But as implants, we are afraid of you know, the electronics killing our printing business. So it's difficult to understand what the clients want. So if we go ahead in, the, in, the, in an aggressive mode and just roll out ebooks all over the place with every printed piece, we ask ourselves if we're accelerating the, the transition towards digital. So right now we are approaching in a case-by-case -case basis when a client comes in and they want to do a special ebook version of a certain book. Even if there's no actual printed piece, we do an ebook version of it. And we try to do a lot more than just having a, a plain PDF style ebook we just we try to do in, insert 
uh, and I'm going to advance here, Barb, so you can see. Uh, so we can do, for example, this is a this is an ebook right now done by our, our great Deb Malevoni uh, at GSTPM, and uh, actually there's a link in your widgets where you can download this exact ebook and you can see what we're doing. So this exact piece has an embedded video in it that this that little uh, blue icon at the bottom, and you, as you flip through it, you have many videos that come up inside the book. So instead of just doing a static ebook, then the, the, the real value of doing ebooks now is so you can embed videos that you can shoot yourself and provide the video to your clients, or you can you know, let them provide the videos to you, if they're, especially if you're doing promotional pieces uh, or if you're on a commercial type implant where you can up and you have commercials and stuff like that. And, uh, and you can do a lot more. You can do links inside. You can, you can provide many different services inside the the ebook. So this is a shot of the printed piece. Which hey, Jimmy, I do have a question. What software are you using to produce this? Uh, we have a contract with Zmax right now, and that's the solution we decided on. Okay. Um, which we really like the way it was displaying the printed pieces because it really was very close to the printed versions of it. Uh, you can also think about doing EPUBs, you know, straight EPUBs that you yep. can read on a Kindle. But coming from the printing, printing world, we like having visuals, and you, you know, that way yep. we won't lose any of the graphics and any of that. So CMAX was the solution, and there are many, many, many providers out there, so I encourage everybody to just start looking at what's out there, what fits your, your products best. And, um, and to tell you the truth, and something that is also interesting is these are solutions that many of our individual units could engage themselves. They can go out and go to Zmax or to any of the other providers and get the solutions themselves and pay a monthly or yearly fee or, or, or individual unit fee and just go out and then, you know, they may not need us for this. So okay. we try to engage these vendors and get an all-you-can-eat uh, business model so we can uh, leverage the volume and provide that same service for the whole institution, and the more the more individual clients we have, the better. And that's the whole thing is the, is is bringing all the vehicles together. Obviously, not everyone can produce printed, really high quality printed pieces. We can, and so if we can add all have all that value added services where we do integrate all the different channels together, that it, and let the let our clients focus on their work, uh, uh, the the real work of the bank, then we think it's a better option for them. Uh, so, so that's that's the value proposition, and and I have a, I don't think every publication is going to have a, uh, uh, an ebook or or videos, and the same way I don't think every video is going to have a companion printed piece. But where they can really work together, it can be an effective one because each channel has its own strengths. Sure. Correct. And, right. we, and we love seeing that. You know, going back to to this slide here. I mean, this is a printed piece that has an augmented reality piece that has a video that we showed and that has a link to an ebook version that we did as well. So it was, it was so great to see. So we're trying to, trying to get that product all around so we can actually provide not only on the brochures, we can do it on books and have a publication with videos embedded, or we can provide a poster for an event and that event can have augmented reality inside. So. Uh, for the strategy, though, I, uh, we really are promoting the multi-channel delivery, but it's a, it's a client education thing because they're, not used, they're used to thinking of us as the print shop and, and, and also or the AV department. And so the whole integrated one is, is a bit of a new thing for them. But, we're, but once we really break through and they get it, they go, wow, that, that, we could really use that. So uh, that, that's something that's going to be ongoing and constant and, is part, and part of our really business development strategy. So I think that, that's a, a key thing. So as I said, I want to become that, that agency, that communication partner with them. And uh, uh, so obviously uh, in looking at it, there's a technology and a staffing uh, component. Uh, you know, the technology also has, has cost to it, and, and it changes rapidly in these fields, especially in software fields and, and things like that. But video is becoming huge. Uh, there's, it's, it's becoming huge out in the world, as anyone who, who has followed YouTube at all, and any of that. It's also true inside the enterprise. Video is becoming huge, and we, got, we have to find ways to handle that and combine it with other channels of that. 
So we have a, a couple questions uh, that we ponder a lot, and that is, will uh, you know, will really promoting and 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 selling eBooks kill our print business? Because uh, print does generate a lot.